continuing on from the previous economic design breakdown on Libra Network, this episode covers my thoughts, analysis, and questions. For its function as a cross-border payment or cross-border transfer with stability, the design is generally good for Libra Network. No interest rates are involved since the coin is not used in a longer capital structure and just for basic day-to-day -day usage. So it's not very complicated, very simple, and not sophisticated. Long-term capital structures would be stuff like your long-term mortgages, your, your long-term treasuries, and your municipal bonds. Before we get started, I think it's better to have a general conclusion. I appreciate that these, the white paper wrote that their goal is not monetary sovereignty. Because honestly, that's very sweet on paper, and I, I like that they have this focus in mind. But in the capitalistic reality of today, money is power. It might not be Facebook's goal to replace the fiat currency, but this definitely increases Facebook, Facebook's power and global global political stance with hoarding so much assets under their, their arms. In terms of crisis and when countries need liquidity, like now, Facebook can come in to buy the short-term government bonds when nobody else wants to, so they become a market maker. And this is a very, very powerful bargaining chip that, and should regulators not abide by what Facebook wants, they can simply reduce the holding of the currency of the country's government assets and switch to somewhere more friendly when it comes to regulations for Facebook. Now, moving on to stablecoins. Stablecoins simply have a better product market fit for transferring value between users, as that's one of today's dominant use cases. With the global economy facing a dollar shortage and uncertainty from the coronavirus pandemic, stablecoins could provide some real-world value connecting people with dollars. There is a need for stable stablecoin. Stablecoin and stable token, or use that interchangeably, are not anything new. They're just packed with an underlying asset, like gold, silver, or some other currency. The Bowman stablecoin has increased because it removes the price in dollar impact and risks and increases the, the use as a medium of exchange because of the lower volatility. Q1 this year of 2020 has seen the best quarter for stablecoins. Stablecoins issuance has ballooned to over 8 billion US dollars in this quarter. One of the most famous stablecoins is Tether, which is now in the top three cryptocurrencies by market cap. Obviously, the, the other two will be Bitcoin and Ethereum. Talking about Ethereum, Stablecoin on the Ethereum network also accounts for 80% of the daily value transfer. All in all, what does this show? It shows that there is an increased real demand for stablecoin. A stablecoin might be the solution or might be the key, a hope that for crypto to, meet, to reach mass adoption. What? New sector for Facebook. Ultimately, I have a few thoughts of Facebook joining the, the financial services sector. Facebook has dominated a lot of industries or a lot of different sectors like personal data, online, advertising, publishing, and media, just to name it. The next profitable jump is into the financial market or financial industry. And this and since they have enough data for KYC purposes and other reasons like your, your anti-terrorism and all the other regulatory purposes, it makes perfect sense. Technically they don't need to enter the financial service space because they can give their money to someone, uh, they can give their money to someone to manage. But the fees payable to someone to manage for for uh, for investment can be quite a hefty fee. It makes sense to monetize the user base and earn low interest returns on the assets. That means earning interest on securities. How do they do that? By Libra coin. If Facebook were to get someone to manage the money and earn the same interest, they would have to find the money to go and buy the government bonds, sit on the bonds for a little bit, and then earn interest with that. Now they don't have to do that. They take people's money, create a digital version of it, allow spending within their network, which is already established, and then they use the money to invest in government bonds and earn interest with that. In episode 5, we talked about opportunity cost. And this is, this is opportunity cost. There is no opportunity cost for taking someone's money, sit on it a little, and keep the interest of that. And this, whereas if Facebook uses their own money, they wait a little bit and sit on it a little, it's an opportunity cost. What is Facebook doing? Part two. Facebook is extracting value from the digital space. This pandemic has shown how reliant we are on the, the digital space. Entertainment, connection, learning, research, donation, funding, what can all be done on the internet. There's a huge value that the digital space brings. But to today, we're struggling to figure out how can we extract this value. Not just extracting this value, but how can we account for this value. Accounting for the value on site because it's the government's job, but as a firm, you want to extract this value. How do we do that? One way to extract the value is to create an economy within the space. Economy with a price. Instead of pricing in their own currency, you, you can reduce the, the FX risk by Using the price point in the real world, hence the stable coin, you just use the price point in the real world and embed it into your little ecosystem. This way, Facebook can extract more value than just personal data and advertising from within its platform. Part 3. I think it's government versus firms. This is probably the most interesting part and that's where I'm 
I'm most invested in and, and most you know, curious about. Liberal network kind of blurs the line between governments and firms. In economics, we have three entities. We have government, firms, and households. Households are like people like you and me. We consume, firms produce, and government gets income from everyone, from taxes, and then they redistribute it to everyone in the economy. Every entity serves, serves a function, has a purpose, and we try to balance the power of all three of them, and everyone's interlinked. As a firm increases its valuation, it starts to behave like government. It can set rules, it can set um, regulations to control behaviours within their jurisdiction, which is the firm itself or the platform in Facebook's case. In Facebook's example, it sets the rules of how to behave within Facebook's platform. That's fine, to be honest. It's just a reminder that firms, firms exist to optimise their profits. They don't exist to resolve inequality issues. They don't resolve to debunk um, fake news. They don't resolve to ensure social inequality or, or social justice. No. Facebook or firms in general exist to optimise profits. That's, that's a very important that's a very important factor to remember. Now let's move on to government. Why do government exist? They exist to optimize social utility. It's not about having high taxes, but how to use these taxes efficiently within your economy, within your country, within your platform, within this jurisdiction that you're in control of. It could be to make education and healthcare cheap or free so that everyone on the household level, like you and me, we get to start on the same guy. It could be supporting and funding startups so that they can fight with bigger firms. It could be to prepare for a crisis like a pandemic today. So when bad things happen, we don't see the, the effects are soft enough, we don't really see the effects. It's hard to be a government if you think about it. There are a lot of things that you have to do and a lot of things are just not so fun. And the thing is, it's difficult to measure success because success means nothing happens. It means that you have had your risk, it means that you have done all the things and all the proper preparations involved so that people feel that, oh, it feels like I, I'm entitled to all of these because, because it, it is what it should be. But no, because the government has taken care of a lot of these kind of things. If nothing happens, it means that the government is doing a good job protecting the nation well enough and ensuring that nothing happens. But the thing is, in the capitalistic world today, everything, is, everything has a monetary value. How do you value this? How do you put a monetary value to how protected we are? It's quite difficult to measure and because we can't measure it, we just ignore it. So that's, that's an that's a important dilemma. Now, as firms get to have the same power as government by creating their own laws, their own regulations, even their own currency, then it blurs the line between firms and government. Is the firm meant to optimize profits like a firm or optimize social utility like a government? It's quite a hard, hard choice to, to take because usually it is a dichotomy. This overlap in objectives. Remember what are the objectives? Firm's objective is to optimize profits. Government objectives is to optimize social utility. At least, you know, in, in theory, that's what government should do. Let's ignore the whole corrupted government, the whole bring your son-in-law in to govern some stuff, bring your daughter in when they don't really have the right qualifications. Let's ignore that all aside. But in general, government, government exists to ensure social utility and social function, more balanced social function within your economy. Now, this overlap in objectives make it very difficult to make the right decision. As mentioned, firms exist to optimize your revenue and it's extremely difficult to... to and very costly to switch focus from profit optimization to social utility optimization. It's not profitable, we don't want to do that because capitalists say that we shouldn't do that. So are we truly decentralized with firms holding so much power? Given so much power and no proper way to regulate it except for ethics and morality, maybe we're not so we're not so near the decentralized future that we want. From an end user's point of view, sure, it's decentralized because you have so many options of coins to use from, you can you can choose um, Tether, through USD, uh, USDC, Facebook's USD, all these different kind of options available. But as you go up the ladder, you climb up the ladder, you start to see that everything is getting more and more centralized, controlled by the hands of the few. And this is not a new phenomenon, you know. This is actually quite common in, in the ETF markets. All the exchange traded funds are usually held by about 12 big banks and 12 big institutions all around the world. And because of that, there are a lot of papers out there analyzing the the level of collusion that could happen, which is not that impossible because everything is just controlled by the same people. So we're not that far off from what reality is. The thing is, how can we make it much better? How can we not bring the problems that we have in the physical world today into the digital space as well? So what's the problem here? On one hand, we have skin in the game issue where these people have more at stake because it's not easy to be in this governance table and making decisions. You have to buy into it. These people also have a lot more experiences, so we can trust them with making the right decision. On the other hand, it's a lot easier to conclude, right? 
when you have control of everything and you have decision making and governance uh, stakes in all of these companies, it's a lot easier to collude and people tend to just collude. So that blurs the line between firms and, and government. Sure, government can always put proper regulations in place and what if firms become so powerful that they define the regulations? How would that work? How, would you, how do we balance this, this firms and, and government kind of differences and different objectives and different functions? That's a very important question to ask because if, if we don't figure that out, then the lines are going to get a lot more blurred. And as we are looking into this whole, everything being on a digital space, everything on being on blockchain, everything, everything moving at a much quicker speed because of technology, then it will just emphasize or it will just amplify all the problems that we have in place. So that's a problem that we have not solved yet, but that's something that we really have to think about. Now, another thing about, about these, this stable coin is DeFi, decentralized finance. So let's talk about the DeFi impact on retail users. I'm looking at DeFi as a retail user, retail investor's perspective. DeFi, decentralized finance, is still going very strong. Libra is not looking at a DeFi space, at least not yet, so I'm not too worried about it. When Libra starts to enter the space of lending, borrowing, trading on margin, I'll be more concerned with the substitution effects on fiat currencies and its impact to the traditional financial market. More generally, a Libra currency is used as a medium of exchange. But the use can evolve over time, and this, this cannot be controlled by the users. This cannot be controlled by the Libra network. It, it's really defined by the users. This is where things become tricky. So three things that I am quite concerned about when it comes to DeFi for retail users. What? Risks, risk associated to holding other currencies. Given the choice, would you rather hold um, Libra USD or Venezuela pesos? The risk associated to holding some fiat currencies is so high that it's better holding on to PEC coins or, or the Libra coin. People only do this when the fiat currency is unstable. If less people hold on to the currency, it increases the instability and only worsens the state of the fiat currency. So there is a real substitution effect on the badly structured fiat currency. Two, relative benefit as a medium of exchange. One reason USD is the global currency is because it is highly available just about anywhere in the world. If anything, the OA crisis and the current pandemic today shows us that the US Federal Reserve is actually more like a central bank of the world than the central bank of just the US. In some countries, due to liquidity issues, it's difficult to get, the US, it's difficult to get USD. Not only that, if you're, if you're a merchant, if you're a trader, it's easy. The best way to trade abroad is to use a currency that's the, the easiest to trade across, across the world, and that's USD. So with Libra stable USD or Libra coin, there's a real benefit to holding these, to holding those in a currency with, that is low in demand and difficult to trade across border. The thing with, with the LBR token or the Libra token is that it's multi, it's multi currency. So it's, it has easier liquidity beyond different jurisdictions as well. Three. Low transaction fees and 24 hours, 24-7 availability. Banks are not open all the time. And to execute foreign exchange, they can charge an insane fee. For someone in Singapore to transfer money to the Philippines via Western Union, it's actually quite expensive. Not only do you have to pay transfer fees, but there is a markup on exchange rates as well. And in the world today, you really don't need to do that because everything can be instantaneous and there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways to get um, very low fees or almost zero, zero markup on exchange rates. So executing it in the digital space, you get to send LBR across border and then charge, change them to your local currencies at a significantly cheaper rate. So this is also very good for, for financial inclusion because one of, the, one of the solutions or one of the goals of the LBR network or the Libra network is to bank the unbanked. And this is one of the very cheap and efficient ways to do that. Lastly, the substitutional impact on institutions. For institutions, the impact is different. Institutions are banks, governments, dealers, and other non-financial intermediaries. One, demand for securities. Since Libra backs the value up, value of coins up with safe assets in the reserve, which are like A plus bonds and your triple A rating bonds, or the or putting money in a money market fund, they could cause a shortage in high quality liquid assets in some markets, potentially affecting financial stability. The reserve assets may get very, very large, as we've seen in Today, when I talked about how there's $8 billion, in, $8 billion of transactions or $8 billion worth of market cap of stable coins in the market today, Libra can, Libra can reach that amount very easily. And this reserve assets can be very, very large. Even just $1 billion is very, very large. So this could have significant implications on the financial market. Large purchases or sale of these assets could move the prices 
in the market. And you know, we talk about colluding, we talk about governance. There are a lot of ways that they could exploit this. They can exploit these information, like right? maybe shorting it before selling or before selling a bunch of stocks, or uh, or um. Yeah, there are a lot of, of selling it first before Libra decides to sell all of its short-term or highly highly liquid assets. So there are a lot of things that Libra could do to impact the financial market and in the secondary market, not just the primary market. To price in LBR. If LBR is successful enough that prices in LBR become sticky, then it will affect trade. The terms of trade would depend on the value of LBR against the domestic currencies instead of between trading partners. For example, a trading partner between Philippines and Mexico pesos. The impact is that exchange rates on trade and economic activities could be muted. What does this mean? The government uses currencies as a tool for bilateral exchange rates and economic activities. When prices are priced in LBR and the price is sticky, it will affect prices on domestic currency and also the impact of bilateral relationships. 3. Displacement of local currency. If Facebook is successful at making LBR the main currency of the internet and people mainly spend in LBR, dollar will go up and down against LBR, not not the other way around, where LBR increases or decreases against the dollar. So if you, so you can end up having LBR as the stable, as the stable currency or you know the base currency, and dollars will seem to will seem to be a bit more unstable and a bit more useless since people are all using LBR. As mentioned earlier, the world exists on more on a more digital space. If everyone in the digital space starts pricing everything in LBR because it's safer, it it spans across different jurisdictions, then we will see a world dominated. LBR. You can convert the LBR into local currency when you travel in the physical world, like a tourist going on vacation to Mauritius. The use case is quite limited. The goal of LBR is to be a more is to be a more useful is to be more useful than any other national currency. Be accepted with lower intermediaries and to be available. It could displace national currencies. Four, impact on fiat money. Fiat money is a signal of how much confidence we have in the country. We keep cash because we have confidence that there, the cash has value in the future. And that means we're pegging up our confidence and our, our value in the system and governance. If more people move the assets to the digital space, it suggests that we are less confident in the fiat's future. Since holding LBR allows transactions beyond one jurisdiction, then it's safer to hold LBR than a single national currency. Because if you think that there is no hope in this specific currency, you have no, no hope in the governance, then at least you would hedge your bet by having your currency in LBR where, you can be, where it can be used across different jurisdictions. Just in case one of these basket of currencies, one of the currencies fail, you have a few other currencies in the basket to maintain its value. 5. Impact on economic, micro, macroeconomic activities. Central bank help to manage the economy through money supply and act, acting as a lender of last resort. If they are unable to monitor and impact consumer behavior, it will be very difficult to support macro activities like unemployment, growth, and inflation, inflation targeting. Can you imagine if right now everyone is just existing on the digital space, and the only the only control that that central banks have is in Libra, and everyone else just uses Libra coin and coordinate and everything. Then how can how the central how can central bank help to disseminate information and disseminate all the the rebates and returns and payments and and loans and funds to everyone to use within the economy? It's very difficult to affect spending. A very a very difficult to boost the economy again and let it grow. And since Libra doesn't do that, Libra just exists as a day-to-day, -day, very simple payment infrastructure for people, they don't think about the long-term implications, they don't think about the long-term impacts, which is where we talked about in earlier of long-term capital structure. Because the objectives are very different from what a central bank is concerned about than having Libra Network as an intermediary to how central bank will be reaching the end user is quite an important factor that we need to consider. Six, impact on confidence. As transactions exist on the crypto platform or the digital space, it reduces the demand even for short-term currencies. There's a shift in confidence from fiat to crypto, and that means the asset reserve used to back LBR reduces because less people are demanding it, the value just reduces. But people still believe in LBR due to price thickness and the network effects because everyone is just using LBR. This could shift backing of LBR from one-to-one -one backing of assets with securities and, and, and government assets to backing it with confidence and faith. And now we go back to the US dollar, uh, how, how the USD has, has dominance again, through so never effects, confidence and faith. And this could be quite dangerous because if we don't plan well enough, we don't think about the long-term impact and long-term capital structure, and we're only looking at short-term, then this could be quite dangerous for the economy. And seven, central bank of the world. 
technology platforms are global and it's easier to coordinate interactions across border than international political bodies. The impact is also more direct since everyone is involved in governance and decision making. So these are you know, seven little points of how, how it could affect the intermediary level or the institutional level. And these are really open-ended questions because there are a lot of impacts that we cannot measure, we can't measure yet. And you know, one of the big debates that I've been having quite a bit for the past one year was, do we need growth? Why, why do we need growth? Why, does, why is it not okay for, for our economy to have 0% growth? As in, we're all doing very good. Why do we need to force growth? Why do we need to force a 2% inflation targeting? Why do we need to keep growing for the economy? And you know, maybe that the answer is, is just this. If we if we behave like Facebook where we don't have growth and we just focus on day-to-day -day spending, then there are a lot of other implications involved, like the opportunity opportunity cost of money. If we stop looking at the future and thinking that there is there is money in the future and forget about the long-term capital structure by creating value of future currency, then people maybe will have less belief in money and money will really just be a means of payment. Whereas that's not the whole purpose of money. Money also has a store of value. And store of value is, is a very important aspect as to why we need the 2% growth every year. So Facebook is, isn't coming up with this, you know, really complicated long-term capital structure of, of doing the inflation targeting, doing all of that, because they want it to be done by central banks. But the thing about how central banks get money, or how central banks have worth, and how the money has worth, is that there are other people using it too. And if Facebook becomes, or Libra becomes so big that it consolidates everyone's demand for money in, within Facebook's, uh, or the digital space, then it's very difficult for central banks to be targeting all these people and, and directly impacting the economy so that, the, so that money has value. And now for the last part of the, of the open questions. One, there's no clear allocation of accountability. Do we have long-term and short-term decision makers on the governance table? Who decides how decisions are made and how is accountability decentralized? I think this is really important because especially when we think about long-term and short-term decision makers. Right now, it seems like everyone is a long-term decision maker, as in, you know, playing the long game or giving a fee and they get to have a seat in the governance table and making governance decisions. But maybe there can also be benefits of having different types of decision makers, different levels of decision makers, different types of decision makers, different time periods of decision makers. They, this diversity could give us a better scope of understanding what is the best decision for all the different participants in the ecosystem. Two, the white paper 2.0 details the AML, CFT, and security impacts of Libra Network. AML is anti-money laundering, and CFT is counter-terrorism, counter something about counter-terrorism counter so that you don't, you're, not funding, you're not funding terrorists. So there are a lot of securities and protocols in place, which is very, very good. But what they didn't, they didn't talk about is reserve management. What, what, what about reserve management? What are the protocols in place? How, how are they being managed? How are they being kept? And thirdly, the white people also did not mention about resolution mechanism, should everything go to shit, or everything goes south, or the world changes. For example, negative interest rates, or reserve value falling below, falling below the, the coins in existence. So if it's zero negative, right now the long-term long interest rates are you know, very, 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 very low, and the short-term ones are still, okay, it's, like, it's still very low, but since 08, the central banks have been exper experimenting actually with zero lower bound and you know effective in effective interest rates, which are negative interest rates. And what about that? How would that impact? How would that impact the the reserve? I know that in the, in the white paper they did talk a little bit about how they need to have you know proper ways to hedge against all these kind of things that happen. They just mentioned like one or two lines. They didn't really talk about it. I think maybe they have not thought about it yet. But these are really important. And the thing, another thing is also, who are they protecting? Pro ho what are these hedges for? Are these hedges for the people in the governance table, which means they have stakes, money, like they have stakes, and they get to earn everything, and not to the end users? Or will that somehow be shared equally to all the users? I think from a firm's perspective, because firms are profit maximizing, right? So from a profit maximizing perspective, all the people at the governance table will be taking the money instead of the, the users, and the end users just kind of live in their little bubble, digital bubble, and just use the currency as it is. I don't know, I don't, I don't think it's that fair, but you know, if that's a way, if that's an exchange for the risk involved, then maybe that's quite fair. And lastly, what about transparency? What degree of transparency are we talking about here? Facebook already captures your online behavior. 
of users. And with data expenditure right now, it also you will also be capturing your offline behaviors. Then it's it's a lot easier for them to be modeling individual behaviors and and this could really impact you as a user, you and me as a user, because they can model so much information about us and it becomes becomes quite a dystopia. Ultimately, why do we need to care about all these? That's, that's the question I always ask at the end of all these episodes. Why do we have to care about all these? Why, why do I need to think about all this? You know, a lot of the things that I talk about seem to be very far-fetched in the future, maybe something that's not relevant until three, five, ten years later, and that's like a very, very long time. Why do we need to care? Maybe I'm dead by then. Maybe the world is dead by then. But we need to care because once everything is in place, it's very, it's impossible to dismantle. You and I both know that the, the financial market is very, very messed up. And there are a lot of things that is just wrong. The OA crisis has already highlighted that. And, and there are a lot of other things that is just more and more wrong. But the thing is, it's so intrinsically blended into our society and into our system that we can't just say, let's scratch all the debts and let's restart. Because it's already so complicated and sophisticated. Right now, we're adding a next level of sophistication by bringing this world into a digital space. And it really reduces the limits and constraints that we have in the physical world. What does that mean? It means that things can get a lot more complicated. A lot more complicated, a lot faster, a lot more sophisticated. And are humans up to that level of sophistication yet? But beyond that, once we create this super complicated system, we cannot dismantle them. It's just fixed. And we really understand the mistakes that we have made in the physical world. And we cannot make the same mistake twice. So, it's very important to think about the cause and effects of every decision that's being made. That's the whole idea of economics design, right? When we're designing all these economies, we, we're not just designing it in the short term. We want to design it in the long term. We want to think about how robust it will be, how, how to reduce speculation, how do we ensure that the system is, is strong enough, or how do we have different kind of stop points in place so that when things happen, it will be delayed so that the financial, so the decision makers can come in to have proper governance in place before the shit, before shit happens. Shit is always going to happen, but how do we design something to reduce that probability of happening? How do we design something to reduce all the mistakes that we know, all the possible cause and effects? That's very, very common sense when you think about it. So that's why this is so important. It's not just about who gets to dominate the world and all that kind of stuff. Okay, fine, geopolitics aside, this will define and shape our future because we are moving to a very sophisticated digital space and, and technology has brought us so much more than you can imagine. So in the world today, we already have a lot of the basics. We have all the basics covered. We have food, shelter, and water. That's the three basic things. And now we're looking at spending what humanity can do with technology, with, with living in a different space and time, with, with moving our, our reality to a digital space. And that's very interesting, and that is the future. We are building the future today, and that's why all of this is so important. It's so interesting, because we are building the economy of tomorrow. But before we start thinking about how amazing it could be, we have to start resolving all the, pro the problems that we have today and not bring the problems with us to the digital future. And then as it gets super complicated, we realize that we're completely fucked. So that's the whole point where these are a lot of important things to think about because there are a lot of costs and effects that we don't see right now, but they're very important to consider when building such infrastructure, when building such, such a big global juris coin or asset that can be used beyond one jurisdiction. Well, till then, if you have any questions, comments, just leave them in the comments below. And if you want to, if you want more, if you have specific themes that you would like to look at, also leave in the comments below. I'll, 